Kia ora. Um, thank you for the very warm welcome, especially early on, and, and for your welcome now. Um, it's a great privilege for me to be with you, um, and I wish to acknowledge um, our hosts who invited me, um, and to pay tribute to the original inhabitants of this land on which we are holding this meeting. So I really want to acknowledge you all. I've chosen the title um, of the talk, Navigating Climate Crises, What Does Adult and Con Community Education Offer? Um, I'm purposefully framing it as a question. Um, I would venture that there's no one person who could claim a definitive answer. And I, I, and I invite you to grapple with this question throughout our time together. Because adult and uh, community education are embedded within other social practices, I'll start with two contemporary stories from very different parts of the world. The first is from Puerto Rico, and the second is um, of two experiences in Southern Africa. Um, this is an overview of my presentation. So just starting with the stories, climate crisis, what crisis, elephant in the room, linking climate crisis and othering, adults and community education, what can we offer, concluding thoughts. The story from Puerto Rico was told by Vivian Cruz McDougall. Um, she is the person over here. Um, and she attended an education meeting we held in Cape Town last year. She lived through Hurricane Maria and its aftermath. Hurricane Maria struck Puerto Rico on the 20th of September 2017, and they are still living with the devastating consequences. This is the map shows Puerto Rico and the Caribbean. Um, close to the, the Dominican Republic, Haiti, Cuba, and just south of the USA. It was the most intense tropical cyclone worldwide during the year, which caused catastrophic damage to the environment and a major humanitarian crisis, including destruction of roads, bridges, the electricity grid, water supplies, agriculture, and so on. There was major flooding, lack of food, housing destroyed, businesses wiped out with the related jobs, compounded by the slow relief efforts. I think uh, President Trump offered to throw a, co uh, a roller towel or something to help them mop up the mess. Fortunately, in fact, when I asked Viviana about that completely disgusting comment, she said, well, the internet di was down, we had no radio communication, so we never heard it. <laughs> so, <laughs> so I was relieved about that. Um, at our meeting, Viviana asked us to imagine one normal day in our lives. So I ask you to do this. Just to think about a normal day in your life. You get up in the morning, maybe you have some breakfast, maybe you get the kids ready for school, and you go about your day. Now imagine that you wake up tomorrow and everything has gone. I know that for, the, for those of you who lived through the earthquake of 2011, this will be only too real, perhaps. Gone is the roof on your house, roads, water, electricity, shops, bridges, your workplace, schools. Puerto Rico is in a hurricane zone. They know about them. They plan for them. But nothing they did helped them prepare for the vengeance of Hurricane Maria. Puerto Rico is a colony of the United States. The US government has appointed a financial oversight board for the island that only allows certain people and certain interests onto the island. They are, in Viviana's analysis, trying to strangle the Puerto Ricans. So they leave their properties and leave the island so that it is available for opportunists to buy up at a cheaper price. This analysis is echoed by Naomi Klein, a well-known North American environmentalist and journalist 
who visited Puerto Rico and saw what she terms the shock doctrine, which she wrote about years before, in full swing. This is where, after a crisis, particular interests position themselves to exploit the situation to their own advantage, with often devastating long-term consequences for the majority. As an educator working in the university, Viviana tells of what the people are learning. People have become far more politically aware. They now really realize that they are a colony of the United States and that their futures are dictated not by themselves, but by a few wealthy people imposed on them. All people across social classes are affected, so all people have to learn to grow their own food, to learn the basics about living, they are learning to work collectively, in some cases run soup kitchens to feed one another, learning to deal with trauma, both their own and others. The suicide rates are high. The one source of energy that survived was solar power. People are realizing the importance of renewable energy. More solar systems have been donated to community centers. Waste management is a problem and community needs to find solutions. Their so-called first world identity has been shaken. They realize that they need to relearn basics about livelihoods. An exchange or solidarity economy is, has been emerging. Everyone and everything is fragile. People need one another. Puerto Ricans in the diaspora are in solidarity and they are linking up people on the island with those in, in New Orleans after the horrors of Hurricane Katrina of 2005 and the slow, inadequate responses they experienced. For some, Hurricane Maria is a gift, as it is giving people the chance to rethink the kind of society they want. They are vulnerable and they have to make life choices about staying or leaving fighting for a more just dispensation, or continuing to be colonized. With accelerated climate change, scientists predict an increase in the intensity of hurricanes. The second story has two parts. The first is from... Um, uh, the first is from March 2019 this year. Cyclone Idai devastated central uh, Mozambique, uh, eastern Zimbabwe, and southern Malawi, so this area here. This is again the worst in the history of southern Africa. The city of Beira has been destroyed. More or less 90% of that city has been destroyed. Thousands of people have lost their homes and many, many hundreds have died or are missing. Entire villages have been wiped out and people are eking out daily life. This shows parents taking their children to higher ground inside an old fridge. From too much water to too little. In 2007 and 2000, uh, 2017 and 18, Cape Town has had the most severe drought in our history, with some other South African cities in a similar predicament. Our country is not alone. Other cities, for example, in the US, Brazil, Spain, Morocco, Australia, Pakistan, are also living, learning to live under drought conditions as the new normal. This is the, the picture of the last remaining water in April 2018 in Tiervatus Kloof Dam, which is the major dam feeding the city. In April 2018, we had the prospect of ground zero, it was called. We wondered if the taps of our city would run dry and we're nearly five million people in the city. Whether we would cope, what we needed to know and do to avoid reaching ground zero, what we needed to do to augment water supply, how we should rethink our relationship to water going forward, 
Water scientists explain that Cape Town's water supplies remain at, at high risk. We live in a water-scarce environment, and drought mitigation must be our new normal. The general perception has been that the onset of accelerated climate change would be slow and measured. This would afford authorities the time to intervene with considered plans. But as has been revealed in the latest report of the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change, indications are far worse than originally predicted. Climate change is a serious disruptor. The experience of drought is changing the ways we think about water and how it is managed. Citizens have halved our water usage within months. Some citizens are acting with degrees of survival pride as we share our achievements of dramatically reducing our shower time. I was a little shocked to see that we, um, they're trying to save water in this hotel and they say we, could, we should limit ourselves to a five minute shower. At home, we do it every three days, and it's 30 seconds. No longer flushing toilets unless absolutely necessary. Clothes being washed infrequently, gardens not being watered, and, and queuing at the natural springs every other day to collect clean water. Grain, gray water systems are being installed along with large water tanks for those who can afford them. Many people are learning new plumbing skills and thinking innovatively about how to get by with less. There is a realization that the framing and reporting of the water crisis has made it appear largely a middle-class problem. People who have grown up in poor and working-class homes ask, so what's new? The drought heightens awareness of the inequalities of the society, of water injustice. Working-class citizens are angered by the misinformation that circulates, at times blaming them for the crisis. They are also angered by the loss of work opportunities as the drought forces contraction of agricultural production and informal economic activities, such as car washes or um, home-based hairdressing salons. Up until now, millions of South Africans do not have access to clean running water in their homes. This has not been seen as a crisis. Why not? Why has an emergency not been declared for millions of South Africans who walk great distances for water, when women and children have the prospect of sexual assault to and from water and ablution facilities? The Cape Town drought has been our teacher in so many ways. It has drawn many of us into the conversations about water and its use, now and into the future. Hurricane Maria, Cyclone Idai, and the Cape Town drought are just three of many examples we in this room can think about in terms of the world um, of climate turmoil and disaster. Every day, we know that our news reports tell us about the latest catastrophe whether it's tsunami in Indonesia that has killed thousands, fires raging in California, and so on. There are many recent scientific reports with credible data pouring forth, which makes any cry of ignorance or, I didn't know, totally inadequate. Fossil fuels are heating our planet at a pace and scale never before experienced. Extreme weather patterns, rising sea levels, and accelerating feedback loops are commonplace features of our lives. The number of environmental refugees is increasing, and several islands, states, and low-lying countries are vulnerable. Some argue that we are on, are on an ecocidal path of species extinction. We are losing, for example, a thousand times, we are losing species a thousand times more quickly than we have ever before. And some climate scientists are predicting human extinction within this century. Some serious climate scientists within this century. That's 80 years. Governments and their international platforms, such as the Paris Climate Agreement, deliver too little too late. 
This is reinforced by the recent IPCC report. Most states, including South Africa, continue on our carbon-intensive energy paths with devastating results. There are growing numbers of environmental activist scholars warning that political leaders across the world are failing to provide systemic solutions to the climate crisis. The private sector are both complicit and often inhibited by the current economic paradigm. And civil society is mostly ill-equipped and uninformed to pressure for change. This is the contemporary context, or is it? In the light of political developments, where there are growing numbers of authoritarian right-wing leaders, to name but a few, Brazil, US, Hungary, Poland, Philippines, Australia, um, <laughs> There has been heightened discussion in the popular media of fake news or post-truth. There are still climate change denialists. Donald Trump, the president of the richest, most powerful and influential country, so far at least, as, as well as the biggest emitter of greenhouse gases in the world being the most prominent. The stakes are extremely high relating to the climate crisis. Hence the major incentive for those for example, in the fossil uh, fuel industry, amongst others, to spread fake news. Citizens, therefore, need, we need to think politically, to be equipped to, inter to interrogate what we are being told and why. This is made more difficult if media is restricted or controlled within context of growing authoritarianism globally. A key, a key aspect of climate crisis is what can be called othering. Edward Said, a very well-known scholar, describes it as, and I quote, disregarding, essentializing, denuding the, the humanity of another culture, people, or, or geographical region. And once the other has been firmly established, the ground is laid for any transgression terrorist attack, violent expulsion, land theft, occupation, or invasion. Because the whole point of othering is that the other doesn't have the same rights, the same humanity, as those making the distinction. What, what has this got to do with climate change? As Naomi Klein argues, perhaps everything. Fossil fuels aren't the sole driver of climate change. There's industrial agriculture and deforestation, but they are the biggest. And the thing about fossil fuels is that they are so inherently dirty and toxic that they require sacrificial people and places. People whose lungs and bodies can be sacrificed to work in the coal mines, people whose lands and water can be sacrificed to open pit mining and oil spills. As, re as recently as the 1970s, scientists advising the US government openly referred to certain parts of the country being designated, quote, national sacrifice areas. As Naomi Klein argues, there must be theories of othering to justify sacrificing an entire geography. Theories about the people who lived there being so poor and backward that their lives and culture deserve no protection. Turning all that coal into electricity required another layer of othering too, this time for the urban neighborhoods next door to the power stations and refineries. In Southern Africa, North America, and elsewhere, these are overwhelmingly communities of color, forced to carry the toxic burden of our collective addiction to fossil fuels, with markedly higher rates of respiratory illnesses and cancers. It was in fights against this kind of environmental racism that the climate justice movement was born. Fossil fuel sacrifice zones dot the globe. 
This kind of resource extraction is a form of violence because it does so much damage to the land and water that it brings about the end of a way of life, a death of cultures that are inseparable from the land. Severing indigenous people's connection to their culture used to be, and in some countries, it persists as state policy. It was enacted, as we all know, through colonization and imperialism over centuries. Fossil fuels require sacrifice zones. They always have. And you, you can't have a system built on sacrificial places and sacrificial people unless intellectual theories that justify their sacrifice exist and persist, which refer to others as less than. The climate crisis raises fundamental questions about the, the kind of economic and political futures that are possible if life on the planet is to be sustained and or regenerated. This in turn raises questions about the meanings of sustainability itself. This is a time when the global community of nations through the UN has adopted the Sustainable Development Goals as a response to the climate crisis. There is a strong argument that the SDGs do not go far enough and are too little too late. Linked to this is the discussion about sustainability. What is to be sustained? For whom? At what cost to life and why? Is sustainability enough? We've already destroyed so much. Should we not be restoring and regenerating? There is plenty of evidence to show that the ubiquitous capitalist economic model of relentless economic growth to sustain consumer markets is part of the problem. Widespread deforestation, for forest fuel emissions, industrialized agriculture, and pollution of water supplies are often prioritized before healthy ecosystems, communities, and cultures, and are contributing to the rapidity of climate change. Jason Hickel points to the fundamental contradictions in the SDGs. As he says, what we need is to tackle the irrationality of endless growth head on, pointing out that capitalist growth as measured by gross domestic product is not the solution to poverty and ecological crisis, but the primary cause. And we need a saner measure of human progress one that gears us not towards more extraction and consumption by the world's elite, but more fairness, more equality, more well-being, more sharing to the benefit of the vast majority of humanity. Your Prime Minister, Jacinda Ardern, at the World Economic Forum this year, also argues for additional different measures, that is, empathy, kindness, well-being. Economic growth ideology has become a hegemonic force, which makes it very difficult to debate, imagine, or implement alternatives. This is one of the largest elephants in the room, which has to be confronted. New Zealand Aotearoa is beginning to set the pace. We need to support this move. As Naomi Klein argues, there are urgent choices to be made to avoid catastrophic climate disruption. Quote, this includes changing just about everything about the economy as we presently know it. She puts forward powerful arguments for ways towards alternative economic systems in a Canadian example, the LEAP Manifesto, a call for a Canada based on caring for Earth and one another. There are many other initiatives where alternative economic systems are being sought. They point to the important pedagogical, political, and organizational work that is needed for new imaginings for a socio-ecologically just future to take root. Educators, activists, and scientists all need to work together to grapple with these major issues. So, how can and should we respond to the climate crisis? I'm touching on just a few preliminary ideas. 
Firstly, deep adaptations. And I'm drawing from uh, the work of Jem Bendel. He's a professor in, at Cambridge in leadership and sustainability. He argues for processes which have everything to do with us as educators. Building of resilience, How do we keep what we, what we really want to keep? Relinquishment. What do we need to let go of in order not to make matters worse? And restoration. What can we bring back to help us with the coming difficulties and tragedies? With this acknowledgement that it is not life as usual, we need to come to terms with a deep loss of life as we know it. We need to embrace, embrace grieving as part of living. A lifelong learning orientation is fundamental to keep to, to respond to the deep adaptations which climate crises demand. People of all ages are affected from birth to death. If we are to imagine an alternative economic system, fundamental questioning of contemporary taken for granted values and beliefs are required. This relates to what we eat, what we buy, how we live and what we value. Within the diffuse learning environments of home, work, the media, and society in general, the indicators for learning cities are instructive. As rapid climate change is a disruptor and can be turbulent, we do not know what is coming at us. So we do need to be open to learn and adapt fast. We do know that it's people who are poor who most often bear the brunt of climate crises. Middle class people have more options, including being more mobile. Building resilience through a lifelong learning orientation at personal, organizational, community and societal levels should assist our collective abilities to respond. Within a lifelong learning framework, adult learning and education covers three quarters of each of our lives. It's a critical and arguably the most neglected part of the education and training system. A critical aspect of a lifelong learning orientation across all generation is the challenging of othering, be it based on gender, so-called race, ethnicity, class, language, religion, age, geography, ability, and so on. The building of tolerance, mutual respect, compassion, and the sense of community is critical to challenging the strategy of divide and rule, which is so powerfully applied around the world. In times of, uh, in the midst of a crisis, it is easy for people to panic. As we have seen in the Cape Town drought, there have been periods when different levels of government blame one another for the dire situation. Different political parties want to score political points, or opportunists want to discredit individual leaders. There have been moments when some citizens have questioned whether there is in fact a critical water crisis, even though the photographs of the near empty dams seem to be irrefutable proof of the situation. It's fertile ground for fake news. The importance of credible, politically neutral interlocutors from universities, civil society, or other institutions are pro have proved vital. The veracity of information being circulated regularly by credible people or organizations is absolutely essential. It's also important to have the infrastructure through media, ICT, and systems of education and training institutions to be able to communicate and engage citizens when crises arise. The inculcation of an approach to learning throughout life, which, which encourages all people to remain curious and creative, 
will assist society's abilities to address the environmental challenges. Presently, with the dominant social construction of retirement, there is a huge wastage of human potential, which is not equitable or just. And just an aside, David Suzuki, a Canadian environmentalist in his 80s, in an interview on possible human extinction, suggests an urgent need for a movement of grey-greens. Anyone want to join me? <laughs> Colin? <laughs> Authoritarianism in various forms creates perfect conditions for fake news to be propagated and flourish. A culture which encourages questioning, curiosity, and broad-based involvement of communities is likely to be an antidote. Debates about the disrup disruption and turmoil created by climate change cannot be left to the few. It's not the politician's problem only. It belongs to us all. The stakes are just too high. Many social movements and civil society organizations are working for climate justice are only too aware of the fraught political context within which they are working. The learning through involvement in these social movements is critically important to imagining alternatives for the future. Climate crises raise many questions about natural resources and forms of energy. It is, with, it is within entangled economic, political, social, and cultural contexts that debates about climate cha change live. It is highly charged politically and economically. It is therefore no wonder that governments or corporations do not necessarily want to encourage citizen participation. Clandestine deals made in secret out of the public gaze are far more common. We need to acknowledge that what we are required to do will not be approved of universally by authorities. It requires degrees of subversion of the status quo. It can be very dangerous work. And hundreds of climate change activists get killed every year. The SDGs and what happens to them at a national or global level needs to be understood within this context. Raskin in Journey to Earthland suggests that we need to combine both idealism and realism in ways that reinforce our hope with scientific rigor as we co-create futures. It is clear that we need a range of adaptive skills, expertise, and commitments, all enhanced through processes of learning to solve the sticky, tricky issues and problems of our time. The climate crisis requires collective efforts of all sectors and levels of society to work and learn together if there's any chance of success. Whose knowledge counts at times of climate crisis? As I've said, it's poor working class and often indigenous individuals and communities who most often have the experience and knowledge of how to respond to the immediate crisis. We do need to promote local indigenous knowledge and strategies, which shows how populations living under multiple interrelated risks employ specific strategies for coping and recovery. Middle class and wealthier people, as we've said, are more mobile and can often choose to leave and go elsewhere. Climate crises can invert who knows more when and where to deal with the situation. The knowledge and strategies of many indigenous people around the world as to how to live in harmony with Mother Earth are sorely needed. Naomi Klein describes the climate crisis as a confrontation between capitalism and the planet. This implies that virtually everything as we know it has to be rethought and relearned. It challenges us personally and collectively to rethink how we live, what we value, and what we stand for. 
It demands that we, cons that we have concern for those with little or no voice in governance, the poor and the unborn. It calls for new and imaginative thinking across all spheres of economic, social, environmental, and cultural life. The political contestations over the future are extremely fierce, as we know. It is time to both resist that which is compounding the climate crisis today, and also to dream to imagine alternative futures. Adults and community education have vital roles to play in both. But these are not neutral or technical undertakings. They involve thinking politically as we teach and learn and organize so that we can become climate change resilient. We have to explore alternative economic systems urgently. I share with you here a compass that for community educators, which comes out of a research project we did on traditions of popular community education in South Africa. I invite you to think about your own involvement in relation to climate crises where, and where you would locate your own community education practices. Do they focus more on the individual? Do they focus more on social mobilization? Are the interventions short-term or, are, or are, are they long-term? And I think this is not, uh, this compass does not say what's right or what's wrong, but it's trying to actually help us locate ourselves. And every context demands something different. For our responses to be concerned with just transitions rather than merely individual survival, we need, as um, Wallerstein urges, to have at the forefront of our consciousness and our actions the struggles against what he terms the three fundamental inequalities of the world, which is gender, class, and race, ethnicity, language. The ways we confront such deep prejudices and discrimination within our society and ourselves calls for life deep learning for ourselves and with others. Responding to climate crises is deeply personal and deeply political. Our approaches need to be permeated with socio-ecological justice sensibilities and commitments which counter separation and alienation of people from one another and which build communities. Adults and community educators are well-placed to contribute expertise and experience to these understandings. And I, have, I hope that in the next couple of days we can really affirm what it is we do bring to these discussions and to see ourselves as, as really contributing um, to ways of, of solving and, and working with these issues. <coughs> Globally, more and more communities are realizing that we have to, learn, we have to mobilize together with, uh, with others to make our voices heard about deep-rooted change. As Han Sung Hee says, we do need collective wisdom to attain sustainable futures. We don't have time to educate one person at a time. We have to find ways of, of trying to encourage a mass consciousness. To change everything, we need everybody. All of us in this room, adults and community educators, are deeply, deeply implicated. Thank you. <laughs>